Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, Chatham House to Managing Innovation for Growth. My name is Sir Richard Sykes, and I'm be your chairman this evening. And uh, as you can see, we have three speakers, not four, but hopefully the fourth is on his way. Uh, we have Lord Hesseltine. Uh, all of you know that he was Deputy Prime Minister from 1995 to 1997. Uh, he is a politician and an entrepreneur, and uh, he produced the book No Stone Unturned in Pursuit of Growth. Uh, then we have Professor Mariana Mazzucato, uh, and she's from the policy unit at the University of Sussex, uh, and her book is The Entrepreneurial State, Debunking Public versus public sector myths. And that, of course, was the stimulus uh, for this evening's discussion. And then directly on my right is Catherine Parsons. She's co-founder of Decoded. Uh, and uh, that's a groundbreaking digital education company. And Catherine is a true entrepreneur. Uh, Will Hutton, uh, who we're waiting for, who has just arrived uh, this second. <coughs> Will is Principal of Hartford College, uh, Oxford, and Chair of the Big Innovation Centre. He's an economist uh, and a leading intellectual. <coughs> and late. <coughs> Good. Well, we're very pleased that you're here, Will. <coughs> so each speaker will speak for about five or six minutes. Uh, then we'll obviously open the uh, uh, session for discussion. So, Michael, would you like to start? Well, it's uh, quite a challenge to take the subject of growth for a national economy and deal with it in five minutes. But uh, uh, this, <coughs> I, I meant to say that for the sake of the obvious, because one is going to skate very fast over a significant uh, territory. Um, we in this country, some of the best universities, some of the best companies, some wonderful traditions of innovation. But of course, if you're looking at the record of a nation, you're not looking at the best, you're looking at the averages. And it is when you look at the averages that you uh, run up against the problem. First, because most of the commentators and the commentariat deal with the extremes of the situation. And um, if you take most of the uh, sort of uh, subjects upon which there's a, uh, there's a discussion, whether it's uh, the quality of education, whether it's the, uh, uh, the, the performance of government, uh, the people invited to comment or the newspapers invited to comment will broadly represent the views of the people that they are appealing to. Uh, you get a pressure group, the CBI, the Institute of Directors, whatever it is, talking about industry. You get the trade unions talking about labor. And they all have big constituencies, very important. What they find very difficult to do is to actually analyze the problems if those problems affect their members adversely and tell it as it is. Let me take two glaring examples. Uh, our education system is, has been the subject of uh, criticism for a hundred years as it's fallen remorselessly behind the more advanced technologies of um, countries like Germany and America. Uh, if you have a debate about education, um, we have 500 schools that are failing schools in the recent publication. Now, there's only one reason you have failing schools, because you've got teachers who can't teach. And uh, so the moment you say that, you point a finger directly at teachers, particularly head teachers, and people don't like that degree of focus. If you talk about productivity, we are 20% behind the Germans and the Americans. Um, now, you can't blame Europe for that, and you can't blame uh, red tape, and the, the civil servants got a relatively small role to play in it. So pointing your finger at productivity means that you and me don't work hard enough. We don't invest enough. We don't work hard enough. We don't uh, initiate enough. We are not as entrepreneurial as people, individually, us, you, me, as our competitors. Very, very unattractive message for a newspaper to put to its readers. 
Um, we have 3,600 trade associations in this country. Just think of that. 3,600 pressure groups, all arguing on behalf of the slowest ship in the convoy. Why? Because all their members will criticize if any of those organizations point the finger in as opposed to point the fingers out. So it's all about um, defending standards which are not good enough. Um, if you look at the pressure groups of the private sector, CBI, Institute Directors, Federation of Small Businesses, um, the Chambers of Commerce, uh, Engineering Employers Federation, um, warring tribes, all trying to get their particular story over. Not cooperating, no, they don't cooperate. Up against every other country has got a really effective small business entrepreneurial, government-backed, financed support system. This country, we don't. Tiny examples, but when I came to write my report, the, the dominating thought that came through time and time again, which as a person who believes in the right of politics, and by the right I mean the right wing of politics, I actually believe in competition, choice, initiative, experimentation, a degree of challenge. This country is run from London on a functional monopolistic basis. Initiative in very large areas is constrained by the techniques of Whitehall. If you are, you only have to think of Whitehall. Housing department, transing department, education department, uh, health department, you name it. Where is Manchester's department? Well, Manchester's department doesn't exist. What you've got are functional monopolies looking down a chain to the machine that re re reflects that monopoly. If it's transport, it's the county surveyor. If it's education, it's the chief education officer. Where is somebody sitting talking about the problems and the challenges and the a SWOT analysis for Liverpool, Leeds, Manchester, Birmingham, you name it. Because that's where Britain came from. Of course, London played a role, but in no way did London create this country. It was created by the buccaneers of the 18th and 19th century, taking advantage of the first mover advantage of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, not the nicest people in the world, but the entrepreneurial pacemakers of the world of that time. They have been replaced by councillors who have a perfectly legitimate social obligation uh, and they do it often to the best of their abilities. But it's not entrepreneurial, it is about social underprovision and the equality of that provision. So the more you look, the more you realize that unlike any other country, we are amateurs in the race for economic success. And uh, my own view quite clearly is that uh, uh, there's a, we need a peasant's revolt, to put it in a sentence. We need the great entrepreneurial centers of this country to stamp their feet and say we won't put up with this domination where everything is organized for us, all the money is constrained, the ring fence grants, the circulars from Whitehall, you name it. Uh, we want a much bigger say in the way this country is designed to reflect what we know to be the problems on the ground. Now, I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Michael. <coughs> right, Will, do we need a peasant's revolt? Um, we need more than, we need that, certainly. Um, but I was just thinking about innovation. I mean, I, and, and I mean, a second or two, I know that Michael agrees with this, and I guess the whole panel does, but uh, I mean, the country's in a real corner. Um, we, uh, we don't have um, a kind of captive markets uh, empire, imperial preference helped us in the 30s. Uh, we don't have North Sea oil, we don't have it's run out or it's running out. Um, we can't have a generation long credit boom uh, to, to kind of make sure demand runs uh, well ahead of both productivity and nominal GDP. Uh, Residents, I think we're actually just enjoying the last property boom um, in zone one and zone two and parts of some other parts of the country 
Um, there are 3,000 postal districts, only 300 of them is property prices going up by 10% over year on year. Uh, in large parts of the country, they're still stagnant. And I think the only way out of where we are is to innovate and invest. And actually, uh, I've known Michael most of my career. And uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, a few people, a few honorable politicians like him who consistently kind of made this point that, uh, that the country has a dysfunctional um, investment and, and innovation system. Um, uh, and we still do. Uh, it's more acute now in many respects than it was even in the 80s when we used to talk. Um, I think that there are, I mean, three, three, two or three things I point to. I mean, I think that the first thing I think is, is that, uh, um, I mean, innovation is, of course, about you know, the embrace of the new. It's being an insurgent. It's, uh, it's challenging uh, incumbents. Um, it's about being able to combine um, things that are there um, to make something that's, that wasn't there before. Um, a lot of serendipity and accident in it, a lot of animal spirits in it. But you can be, um, I think you can say two things about um, what are likely to be um, the circumstances in which you get more of this rather than less. The first is, I think you have to have firms that are kind of porous to the outside, um, not just in the sense of knowing that they don't know, they don't know all the answers themselves in a highly complicated world where making scientific and technological mistakes is terribly uh, easy. Uh, it's kind of more than that, actually. They, they so take that to their bosom that actually they are, con they are challenging and setting challenges constantly uh, to their collaborators and their supply chains um, about how they can move their business model forward. It's a kind of frame of mind. And it's a frame of mind, I think, that comes with a deep understanding of what your purpose is as a firm. And one of the things I think that's happened in the last 30 years in both Britain and to a lesser extent America, where actually you think it should be the other way around, but actually shareholder value maximization and financialization, uh, you know, prioritizing share buybacks and dividends distributions over that, spending that money on innovation, investment and innovation is more acute in Britain than it is uh, in the United States, that's partly because of the way remuneration is structured, directing so many people's um, remuneration to um, uh, the share price and all that flows um, from that. And I think that we need actually to think about changing company law so that actually incorporation can only take place and all the privileges of limited liability can only happen if you incorporate around a declared business purpose and your fiduciary obligation as a director and as a shareholder uh, in that firm is more broadly defined than actually narrowly financial, but actually the broad prosecution of that business purpose, a business purpose with which, which if you're to stay in business, is going to require you to innovate and invest. Um, I think it's a very simple thing to do, and I think it would transform, actually, the dynamic of um, uh, quoted companies and, indeed, um, family firms that are actually hoping to exit in the markets um, to, to actually put purpose um, would, I think, remoralize uh, our uh, capitalism and it would actually give a big, big incentive to invest and innovate um, rather than actually think about exit, take over the next deal as actually the fundamental business strategy. That takes place within um, a, with in a, an innovation ecosystem. It, people in, in the innovation kind of in the world of, kind of theorizing about this, we've been talking about ecosystems for a generation. Uh, but the kind of innovation ecosystem that was right for the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s is different again um, in an era of digitalization. Um, and when actually the pace of, of uh, business model change and actually what's possible to do in the world of things as well as the world of services is so very different. Um, I think we have to develop a financial system that will um, support, bank, and invest in intangible assets. I think we have to develop an intellectual property regime uh, where actually the incentives are um, to share and license rather than um, wholly to own. I think we have to develop a uh, m much uh, better por porosity between um, universities and the business community. I think these new catapults, uh, one of, I've just joined the board of one actually, the satellite applications catapult, uh, which are about technology transfer, need to be really scaled up um, and be kind of open innovation catalysts um, in a way uh, that the Fraunhofer's are in Germany. 
I think we need a, bit, a banking system that actually um, is banked to and by the central bank in a way that permits it to have a much wider class of assets which it knows it can take to the central bank to be rediscounted for cash if and when the banking system gets into trouble. Importantly, and probably the most important thing said in the last 12 months, is that Mark Carney intends to do just that. Um, so bringing the uh, Bank of England uh, after over 100 years into line with um, the US Federal Reserve, um, uh, the Bank of Japan, and indeed actually the European Central Bank, uh, which uh, is just carrying forward the old habits of the Bundesbank. Um, I think there has to be a really aggressive competition policy. We don't really get it. It's amazing in this discussion about the energy companies that nobody, as far as I know, has called for a competition inquiry. Unbelievable, really, uh, when it's actually obviously um, about incumbents with um, dysfunctional business models and a dysfunctional structure. To think about how to design markets so they have a propensity to innovate and invest within them. And if you get that um, with the state actually catalyzing, and Mariana will talk to this much better than me, uh, ca catalyzing, um, giving grants where necessary, socializing risk where necessary, um, you will actually have an ecosystem that will support these kind of, uh, this new kind of innovative corporate structures I think we have to have. And of course, the last thing is that you have to, you know, innovators um, want to uh, change the world. I'm always very struck, actually, when I spend time in um, either the West or East Coast, around Boston or around California, that these people, you know, their, 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 their value system is, of course, you know, um, they want to have, you know, they want to be part of the team that's going to be part of the next initial public offering that's going to make them very, very rich. They always think about scale. Um, by the way, that's an important reason for our, to sustain our membership of the European Union and to think harder about deepening the single market rather than withdrawing from the European Union. And they think about scale, they, they think about, but they also think about the team they're in. And they also think the degree to which they're going to make a difference. Um, and there's a whole kind of startup kind of culture that, in, that infects everything from large companies right through uh, to people doing their doctorate or their postdoc. And it just doesn't exist to the degree it should do in Britain. And we have to recognize that and recognize that actually that's what people want to do who innovate. And they may also want to make some money. And actually, uh, I, th I think that we have to differentiate, this is my la very last point, between uh, money that's made from genuine value generation and money that's made actually from distributing value. British business is far too much accented and around prioritizing, distributing pre-existing kind of rents and super profits from a, a, an incumbent license and not actually being a challenger doing general risk taking. Too much capital, whether it's in the circos, the capitas, whether it's in the banks, whether it's in the big pharma, uh, wherever you look to find um, capital deployed in Britain, it's actually um, deployed to be a rontier and not actually to take genuine risk. And then the people in charge of these rontier companies pay themselves as though they were taking genuine risk. So along with, alongside Michael's kind of peasant revolt, I want, uh, I, I want a revolt of the innovators. Okay, thank you, Will. Mariana? Right. So, I mean, what I find interesting often in these discussions is that even though I agree with, you know, the individual policies, so the catapult centers, I have, you know, nothing against them, obviously, the apprenticeships, very good program, um, you know, the SBRI program, which in this country has tried to imitate the U.S. SBIR program, which is trying to um, provide early stage financing for companies mainly through procurement. The problem is that the framework through which these policies are being both thought about and implemented is really very narrow. And unless we have a discussion both on the framework of the policies, but also what we even mean by things like public-private partnerships and an ecosystem, what kind of ecosystem, what kind of indicators do we actually have on whether the ecosystems that we're building are you know, really symbiotic ecosystems. If you know anything about biology, this is the first thing they you know, differentiate with ecosystems. Symbiotic or parasitic. You know, are we in the predator-prey type of ecosystem? And without being too accusatory, the point is that only if you have a framework through which you really understand how and, you know, how and why an ecosystem is important, what role the public sector has, not just in fixing markets, but actually actively designing, as, as uh, Will was saying, but shaping and creating markets, then actually lots of the details of these policies, including the catapult centers, including these uh, you know, different problems around technology transfer, what am I doing with this microphone, um, get it wrong. Okay. So first, though, I wanted to say that the reason I think we're here and the reason why you know, Heseltine's report was so important and was given the attention that it you know, rightly got was because after the financial crisis, 
um, we became really aware of just how you know, problematic the situation was where financial inter intermediation completely outpaced the growth of sort of the productive economy, the real economy. Um, and if you're interested in you know, graphs that show this really well, I suggest you look at Andy Haldane's work. It's probably the most you know, um, lucid, if you want, rendition of that problem. Now, the problem, though, is that then this industrial policy, innovation policy, entrepreneurship policy, the way it's been positioned, sort of big bad finance, you know, bad hedge funds, credit default swaps, derivatives, versus great real economy, right? So we have a life sciences strategy, for example, that's going to try to nurture this you know, real industry, a productive industry, an innovative industry, I don't know what I'm doing, um, versus you know, this terrible finance. And the problem is, is that the real economy, including, you know, the life sciences industry, including lots of what's happening in IT, is just as sick as the financial sector. And until we you know, fix that sickness, we're actually setting up the next bubble. Because a healthy finance, and all this now concentration on getting finance to be healthy again, while leaving the real economy as sick as it is, is the perfect recipe for the next casino. Um, and you know, measures of that sickness, I mean, some of this uh, Will just mentioned, just look at things like you know, different proxies we have for how financialized the real economy is. Companies like um, Amgen, I actually have data on these companies over the last uh, 30 years, have actually spent in the last decade more on share buybacks than on R&D, except in one year. This is the case of that particular company, but it's just as true for most of the big uh, pharma companies. And you know, Cisco basically also went down that route since the early 2000s. So these are not companies like you know, the equivalents of the Xerox Parks and the Bell Labs of the you know, 60s that were investing a large portion of their profits back into these long-run growth areas, call it human capital, R&D, whatever. Um, so that's a real sickness, which unfortunately, to be honest, has not been at the core of rethinking innovation and industrial policy. And until it is, that's basically what we're going to be doing. We're going to be throwing money at different industries that are very sick um, as opposed to reforming them. But first of all, I'm actually quite tired of talking about innovation because innovation to me is just one of you know, the reasons why I'm, well, put it this way, I'm very interested in capitalism as a dynamic system and very few people have actually written about capitalism as a dynamic system. If you read Marx, he did describe capitalism as you know, incredibly creative and th you know, throwing down walls, but so did Schumpeter. And what's fascinating is that neoclassical economics, still today, the economics that people study in micro and macro is very static. So we still talk about res uh, representative agents. We still assume Gaussian distributions of variables and ignore these big fat tails, even though with stock prices we've you know, come to admit that. But most um, you know, innovation occurs in massive clusters, um, which actually means that it's very, you know, it is not a random walk. It is not identically um, and independently distributed over time. Um, and yet many of the assumptions we apply in both the quants and the theory in economics completely ignores that. But then the point is, what is it that we actually then mean by setting up these ecosystems? What does it you know, mean to economic theory, the, the theory of the firm, the theory of competition? And the problem I've been sort of highlighting, and I use innovation as a root in, but I, it's not an end in itself, right? Is that what we've basically had in this real economy that I just said is sick is the same problem we have in the banks, which is we've socialized the risks but privatize the rewards, okay? Which again, people like Andy Haldane have said about the financial sector. Now what I mean by socializing the risk is actually really understanding then what it is that the public sector has played. Over the history of capitalism, it hasn't just de-risked the private sector in these ecosystems, it's actually taken on risk in a really courageous way, and that's why I call the book The Entrepreneurial State. And you only see this really when you look at countries that actually have grown through innovation. It's very few countries, so this is not the state all over the world. But if you look at places like Singapore, Korea, Finland, Denmark, Germany, China today, I definitely want to talk to Will about China because I disagreed a bit with your article in The Observer and how you ca uh, categorize China. These are countries where the state has actually played a leading role in terms of really welcoming and taking on the real sort of risk and uncertainty, which is in fact at the basis of capitalism. So, you know, feudalism, 500 years of inertia, capitalism based on this change, which again, that both Marx and Schumpeter talked about, often the lead agent in actually sort of, you know, catalyzing that radical change, which doesn't mean just radical innovation. Huh? Lots of this sort of radical stuff occurs also through incre um, incremental changes. Um, has actually been through the state. And so the examples I usually give are both you know, the iPhone or every single technology that makes it a revolutionary and smartphone, 
all the technologies behind it, like the internet, GPS, touchscreen display, and even this new Siri voice activated system, it's all government funded. So then you do need someone like Steve Jobs or the venture capitalist to come in and sort of rearrange things in different ways. But what they're doing basically is surfing a massive wave of state investments which are not justified just through our usual framework in economics, which is the state coming in and just fixing some sort of market failure. The market failure perspective would, for example, justify why you need the state to fund basic research. Basic research is a public good. It's really hard to appropriate, so the state needs to do that. Almost everyone agrees with that. What they don't realize is that what the state did behind all those technologies, as well as behind most of the new molecular entities, which have priority rating, right? So the really radical new drugs is fund both the basic research, the applied research, and even fund, you know, provide this early stage risk finance, which increasingly VC is not providing, right? They want their returns in three years. They focus on the exit. They're mainly entering after this really high risk stage. So once you see those examples, and I focus a big part of the book on telling those examples, you start asking, well, hold on, you know, I took a finance class once, and there's this risk-reward relationship. That's the first thing you learn, risks and returns. Where's the return? And how economists have thought about the return is basically through tax, right? So, you know, these companies which then make billions, yes, fine, through these government-funded technologies, will pay back tax. Well, they don't. Right? You know, Apple, Amazon, Google. Google's algorithm was funded by the state, the National Science Foundation. The National Science Foundation today is in massive crisis because you know, of all the pressure there is on cutting these government budgets. So the companies themselves find legal ways not to pay back the tax, but also um, uh, the, the uh, taxes have evolved over time actually through a story about innovation. So capital gains tax was actually quite high. It was, it was about 40% in the mid-70s after just eight years of the National Venture Capital Association lobbying government saying, we're the risk takers, reduce our tax because we're the big entrepreneurs, um, it went down to 20%. This was just in 1981, it was already 20%. And since then, it's been falling through a story about, you know, we are the risk takers. So part of this rebalancing that I've been arguing for is let's rebalance the story we tell about innovation. So if we are then going to be reducing all these taxes and think about even things like R&D tax credits and the patent box, which the latest estimation is it's going to hurt the budget by nine billion uh, pounds over, over the next five years, um, you know, there's no evidence that any of those tax reductions actually incentivize innovation and investment. They simply basically increase inequality. <coughs> And so the socialization of risk and privatization of reward in the real economy, just like in the financial economy, has in fact massively increased inequality. And lastly, and I'll just shut up because I'm probably over, is the other thing, so what I argue there is we need a more direct way for government to get back that reward, perhaps even retaining equity. This is something very common in, um, in, in places like Scandinavia. But the other thing is that these ecosystems, we need to be putting more pressure on the private sector to actually step up to the game. And so you have the American Energy Industry Council with these six CEOs, including Bill Gates, asking the government to put in money today in clean tech and where are they putting their money? Mainly in these share buybacks. So they've spent $300 billion over the last 10 years on share buybacks, the key seven companies in this Energy Industry Council, and they're asking government to spend $16 billion through this new ARPA-E program. And I find that problematic. So on the one hand, yes, the state is entrepreneurial. It's done these great things we haven't had a framework to talk about because we just talk, talk about it as fixing markets. On the other hand, the last thing we want to do is just ask the state to do more and more without putting pressure on these companies to you know, increase their own commitment. Thank you. Catherine? Hello. Uh, I think I'm representing the optimistic peasants uh, <coughs> revolting here. Uh, I'm uh, you know, an entrepreneur and uh, a woman, uh, and I'll get onto that topic in a minute. Um, and, but definitely, we are a very, very vision and values-led business. Uh, we're very optimistic. I think you need to be as an entrepreneur. And uh, you know, we really do believe that we're kind of changing the world. And it is something that you do see a lot more of in Silicon Valley. But um, just a little bit about kind of Decoded and the work that we're doing. Um, we were nominated one of the top five most innovative businesses in the UK, but we had no idea that we were being innovative while we were doing it. You know, we just thought we were being, we had no processes. <laughs> I think that might be another word for innovation. But um, Decoded, essentially, it, uh, you know, we started with, with, you know, a mission, actually. Could you uh, take anyone and everyone and teach them how to code in a single day? A totally kind of mad thing. And uh, you know, we never even dreamt that we could go and ask someone for money or investment for that kind of a, an outlandish claim, an overstatement that we'd like to over-deliver against. And uh, I'd actually set up my first business in 2007. 
Um, and this was just something that, you know, was just a kind of burning ambition, put all our kind of time, money, energy into it to deliver against it. And to kind of cut this long story short, I mean, we really started up because um, my background was creative, and I saw that the distance between the people who actually create and the people with the ideas was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, there was a huge digital divide between the makers, the people who had the knowledge, uh, and the people who uh, were, you know, who had the ideas. Uh, but actually, I should have, we should have kind of guessed that that was a bigger issue than just the creative industry alone. But if we're totally honest, uh, we, we didn't, and it just kind of um, evolved to us over time. Um, so in the last kind of, it's, it's been two and a half, kind of three years, we've had anyone from the boards of FTSE 100 CEOs right through to startups, uh, beekeepers, uh, you know, investors, people who've taken a few years out of work, especially women who've been told, you know, you'll never catch up, it's all changed. Um, what we really noticed was this, this skills gap, this area of, you know, fear about technology and, you know, all the smoke and mirrors was a universal uh, gap. And um, that's got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's, um, you know, in the last kind of two and a half years, we probably taught kind of, you know, four and a half thousand people. Um, and I can definitely call us a global business. Um, it's, you know, in the last kind of, in two months alone, we will have been teaching in Dubai, in a castle in France, which I quite like, um, uh, you know, San Francisco, uh, Atlanta, um, Shanghai, Singapore. Um, there's a kind of real global need for these skills. Uh, but there are kind of like three quite interesting things kind of going back about how it came about. We didn't have a plan. You know, a lot of people talk about business plans. I certainly never studied, uh, you know, any kind of innovation academics kind of, you know, really about it. We, we just had a bit of a, a mission and we definitely didn't have any investment either. And I think the landscape's changed quite a lot in the last two and a half years alone. I mean, we're an East London based business. You see a lot of really exciting stuff coming out of there at the moment. Um, we've had a lot of exposure since we launched. I think another surprising thing is that our marketing budget, needs must, uh, was uh, £27 and has been since we launched. Um, you know, we're an entirely word of mouth grown evangelistic kind of business, but it was because we had to be lean. You know, we were a self-funding uh, entity and we still are. Um, and we never went out to set up an education business. You know, we, we actually went out to set up a transformation business. Um, you know, there's a lot that's bad about education. We all have some bad memories of education. Uh, and uh, what we wanted was to create something that really kind of changed people. Um, but we just launched Code Ed because the problem is really, really deep. You know, um, children aren't being taught these skills in school. Uh, what's well, since under a computing curriculum, although it has actually changed and it does look really good now, um, you know, computers don't sit within the computing room anymore. I mean, that's the point. Um, you know, they're, they're part of our lives. But we're basically, there is no talent pipeline at the moment when it comes to digital literacy and skills in the UK because no one is being taught these skills, which is also the reason that no one should be ashamed that they don't understand uh, technology. But we do need to empower teachers to bring their subjects alive through technology in the classroom. Um, and just a few things that I've noticed about kind of innovation and, and along, along the way is um, I actually suffer from the problem I'm trying to solve. You know, I can't hire the skills, you know, I find it very hard to hire the skills I need within my business. They're really expensive. I'm looking for a hybrid between IQ, EQ and something we call TQ. And um, believe you me, it is a global hunt for that talent. And, uh, you know, we... Uh, we're looking in universities, you know, all around the world for people who can not only teach digital skills from data, cybersecurity, but are brilliant and eloquent communicators. Uh, very, very tough. And it's not just me suffering from that uh, issue. I'll definitely tell you that. Um, investment. Um, I think, you know, there's, uh, I think the landscape's changing in terms of investment in startup, but I mean, it is nothing compared to, you know, America at the moment. I know people who hop on planes uh, after they've had, you know, a few months of just dud meetings in the UK and they come back with investments. So kind of what, what's kind of going on? Where's that leap of faith? Um, and, you know, number three, the USA versus the UK. Um, you know, there's a, there's a kind of saying going around East London that, you know, the UK's become a bit of an incubator. Uh, make all your mistakes here and then you go to the US. 
I mean, is that what's happening? Um, and number four, innovation. Used to, I used to kind of groan, actually, if someone called like an innovation director would come and you know, try and kind of engage with us, because it was usually, they were a lone agent within their company, never given kind of any budgets. You know, it was really kind of, we'll put innovation in the corner. That has changed, and I'm definitely seeing that amongst our clients. And we are teaching 450 different kinds of businesses. Innovation seems to be becoming a much more central thing, I think. Really, it's people are wondering, how can we bring this into the heart of our businesses? And it's very, very exciting to see that. And they want to learn the kind of, about the kind of startup culture and how they kind of borrow little bits of that, I think. But also women. You know, um, you know innovation is not just, um, you know, if you're going to invest in innovation, invest in women. Because they're using products, they're using digital products, they, they, but yet a lot of this stuff is being built by and created by men. Um, I, I met an investor in the last few weeks. He said he never has and never would invest in a woman, except the fact that it was just kind of a trendy thing at the moment to be a woman in business. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a startup incubator that um, only 4% of its investments last year were made in female-led businesses. Um, so if we're going to invest in innovation, we need to invest in women. Thank you very much. <clears throat> OK, so we've got about uh, 18 minutes for questions. Uh, there are some roving mics. If you would stand up, give your name and your affiliation, please, uh, and wait for a microphone. Sir. Okay. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, my name's Ewan Grant. I'm a former tax inspector and intelligence <coughs> analyst. And uh, my question, which is for the entire panel, might seem as another uh, case of somebody putting in the boot to big pharma, but uh, I would point out in relation to Sir Richard's presence that I've worked in the ex-Soviet Union, so I think we should fully recognize um, what he went through and what he did in terms of good governance in relation to ENRC. But my question is, um, where does the pensions industry, what part does it have to play in innov innovation? And if that hasn't been done too well, or indeed if it has, um, does the blame, if any, lie with the, that industry or with the tax system or a bit of both? Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> Michael, do you want to start that? <coughs> the Chancellor has <coughs> uh, <coughs> indicated the, the desire to find a way of bridging the demand for money with the supply of money. Within the pension and institutional world, money is there on a scale beyond the wildest dreams. What they cannot find is a vehicle that gives them the security that they're quite rightly concerned to achieve um, uh, and, uh, in what essentially are risk-making projects. Um, uh, my own personal view is that this should be capable of resolution, but nobody has yet resolved it. The Chancellor wants to. Anybody else? Well, I th I, 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 I'm not sure about this. Um, they, uh, I was chatting to uh, someone in the Department of Business who was very close to the recent privatization of uh, the Royal Mail, and they were trying to get long-term investing institutions to come into the Royal Mail. That was one of the reasons why the price was pitched at 330p. And actually, some of the institutions that you would think um, were sitting on this kind of weight of money were simply unwilling um, to take tranches in the Royal Mail, for God's sake, at 330p. Um, and, this, and they were looking for returns that were higher even than the, than, than the kind of yields and prospect, prospects at 330. Now, of course, the shares are above five pounds. And you know, I do think there's a kind of, um, and you find it continually, um, that, I mean, when you come to infrastructure, that actually, I mean, I, we've, um, Marianne picked up this point, but I, I think it's astonishing that you know, Centrica um, couldn't, take, couldn't take the risk um, with EDF Energy of co-building co uh, the next generation of um, nuclear power plants, because they, instead of which they um, spent 500 million pounds in a share buyback. You know, there's a, you know, actually, um, I used to have this argument with um, Sir Mervyn King when he was um, uh, governor used to say, look, I used to say, you know, why is it that actually our financial institutions are looking for returns 
north of 15, often as much as 20% in payback of three years, you know. You say, oh, well, well, you know, it'll all come down when the nominal rate, it's, an, it's, a, it's a money delusion. It'll all come back when actually uh, the inflation rates kind of, uh, the long period in which the inflation rate is kind of 2 or 3%, that money illusion will, will. And here we are, you know, we've had more than 15 years of inflation rate and they're still looking for 20% rates of return real and three-year <coughs> paybacks. So a lot of money out there, but the returns they want are beyond extravagant. So you can't do, you, so that, you know, if I was on the board of Centrica, I'd have probably had to go along with all the rest of them and say, you know, actually the expectations of our shareholders are so demanding, we can't do this. Yeah. And I think it is, I think it is a, a really, really big issue. And that's why, that's why I homed in when I talked to, about business purpose and, and trying to change the dynamics of it and trying to get people to kind of um, lower their expectations. Uh, I think one reason why private equity in, um, is turned out to be such a malevolent force in Britain and so unconstructive is actually the rates of return and within these five-year periods in which they have the funds under management are incredible. And they become forcing houses for kind of really silly investment decisions. So, I mean, I think that, you know, we need, I mean, the chances I know well-intentioned on this, but the amount of money that the pension funds and insurance companies come up with is, is really, you know, trivial, that's so sadly. Okay. Gentlemen here. <coughs> Thanks very much. Uh, David Skidmore, surgeon. Um, I've had 50 years experience of an organization called the Health Service, where on the one hand you've got guys like myself who have to um, sort out chaos and uncertainty as it's going forward against the managers who behind us want to ensure that under no circumstances can they be found to be blaming blame for anything that's gone on. So you have a sort of whole tick box mentality. I look in the Economist and I see all the business schools which it seems to me are replicating this managerial structure to prove that you can actually do nothing wrong. You've got this totally retrospective approach within those types of organizations. It does seem to me from what the ladies have said and, and my own view anyway, that one's got to actually go out into clear blue space and start going forward. But how are we going to nail down not just the managers, but equally more than managers, the civil servants who want to prove that there's no way they could possibly have done anything wrong working in Michael's department when he was a, when he was a minister. <coughs> How are we going to deal with this impossible chasm between the retrospective guys on the one hand and the girls and the boys like the people I respect in my job who are going forward and understand chaos theory and, and uncertainty? Thank you, Mariana. Well, I think that's a really important point, and I think what it highlights is that we've, you know, if you look at some of the most important areas within strategic management, it's actually been applied precisely to the problem you raised, but in the private sector. So when you have a mature corporation, how do we, you know, revitalize it and actually get it to welcome failure and to, you know, create uh, revolutions from within, but by dismissing the role of the public sector, right, as at best, again, fixing market failures and not being a lead creator and shaper of markets, we haven't applied those lessons within the state. And if you look at those state agencies, because when I talk about the state, I'm actually talking about a very decentralized network of different agencies within all these countries that I've been looking at. Um, so, but in the US, so in the Silicon Valley part of the world, if you look at what you know, DARPA did, but also ARPA Eat today, which is trying to do what DARPA did for the internet, but in renewables, these are agencies that have very explicitly said, if we want to you know, do innovation and fund it, we have to be innovation from within. We actually have to understand that we will fail. And we have to welcome failure. The problem is, however, that unless you also then have the population understanding what these agencies are doing, and there's no understanding of that. So even the whole Obamacare thing, you know, the state is meddling in your health care choices. How many Americans know that, again, 75% of radical new drugs are coming out of NIH, public funds, right? So if they knew that, that whole debate would have at least been different. Um, and so you just raise an extremely important point because there's nothing in the DNA of the public sector that's going to make it less innovative and less able to welcome failure. But you need a framework through which to understand that. And again, even in Singapore, or take BNDS, which in Brazil is one of the lead innovation agencies. It's their state investment bank. They're thinking very clearly about this. They're saying, if we're going to be funding innovation, we have to completely do different types of risk analysis. We have to be able to differentiate the risk that comes from actually investing in these really scary areas from the kind of risk, you know, just because a company is not a very good investment. And banks actually don't know how to do that. So we did a study with an Italian bank and actually looked at their credit scores. And we found that they had an equal probability of giving a bad credit score 
to um, very productive companies and very non-productive companies. And you know, then we ask ourselves why, and that's because the very productive ones are actually investing in these really difficult areas, and those are high risk. And the banks don't know how to differentiate that. But so these are related topics and how to get places like this and the TSB to also be innovative within and not just through is a huge challenge. I've seen, I've seen incredible, um, it's been innovation being embraced. And innovation for a lot of people at the moment is really kind of overlapping with digital and transformation because they're seeing that affect their business. From a senior level, I've actually been really overwhelmingly you know, impressed. And there's a lot of uh, young innovation happening. But then, funnily enough, with the bigger businesses, what happens is they then look at their kind of middle layer, which I suppose you could call, like, it, it's the biggest part of their business. And they see incredibly traditional skill sets. And it's quite a scary realization when you think, well, how, can I hire from the outside? No, that's not going to change things. How do I change from the inside? The answer is, is you need different skill sets. And actually, those hybrid skill sets, and maybe you need a lot less of those <laughs> skill sets. So that's quite a scary thing. But um, yeah, no, I do love this culture of embracing failures and testing, uh, but uh, as long as the ambition isn't to fail. Yeah, one really important example <laughs> in the UK, which to me just says everything. So government digital services was going to make this new website so people actually didn't go to Google but went to a government website to do searches. And initially they were like, oh, that's going to require all these kind of you know, Silicon Valley skills and we can't do it. We don't know how to do that. So they outsourced it to who? Circo. <laughs> um, and Circo charged them $25 million to make a completely crap website that was you know, very static, not dynamic. And then someone from within government said, why don't we just hire within government top coders and you know, software designers? And they spoke to someone in the BBC. Because the BBC did iPlayer from within. That's completely anti-tendency where we outsource that kind of things, right? In a public agency, the BBC is a state agency. Um, and they did that. They brought in all these, you know, geeky guys in government, civil servants, and now they've just won this, you know, really important design prize. So YouGov, and it's costing government 10 times less than what Circo was charging them. But that requires us to hire within government these top, you know, skills. And can we do that with all this pressure on the budgets? Lady here. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Abby Semple, member of Chatham House. Um, the, I think several of the speakers um, suggested there may be a role for Europe in all of this. And um, innovation is certainly a word that gets used a lot in Europe and increasingly has not insignificant funding linked to it available to both the public and private sectors. My question is how damaging is the current attitude um, within Britain towards the EU or within the government towards the EU in terms of, of um, fostering that relationship does Britain need to be looking outwards as well as inwards in order to support innovation? Well, of course, you've only got to look at the last thousand years to realize that there's always been something of a controversy to our views about Europe. And uh, that hasn't changed, and I doubt if it will. Um, but if you ask the specific question, is it doing us harm? Of course it is, because uh, uh, it is the UK isolationist party is peddling a world which doesn't exist. Uh, the idea that we can be independent of Europe. We've never have been independent of Europe. Uh, it is on our doorstep. It is our marketplace. It is just there. And um, if you think you're going to be outside it very well, they'll fix the rules as 60, 40, 50% of our trade goes there the conditions upon which the products can go will be determined by them and not us. And it's called the common agricultural policy of 60 years ago when we said no. And so the farmers of uh, France fixed a deal with the industrialists of Germany that suited them and not us. And we've been complaining ever since. Um, <coughs> you know, um, we have this extraordinary view in this country that we're so much cleverer than everybody else. Um, you know, um, it makes me weep, frankly. The only real role, the only real role for this country is to be a pace setter in Europe, is to have a, an agenda about investment, innovation, wealth creation, prosperity, human rights, all these things, and create our own impact on one of the world's great groupings of power. And if you want to see the world of today, it is about great groupings of power. We are a midget in that context on our own. In Europe, we can be a pacemaker. And historically, that has been a traditional British view. 
I don't see a reason for changing it. Gentlemen. <coughs> yes, uh, Peter Rowan from Ados Holdings and Chetham member. Um, in particular, I wanted to look at uh, how we could potentially cultivate uh, the city's already existing positioning amongst ultra high net worths, family offices, and uh, its position now, it's, it's, it's obviously a hub for wealth preservation. Now, I'm c taking a view more from ultra high net worth, family offices, etc., that I've uh, viewed or, or worked with abroad. Uh, giving Mumbai India an, as, as an example. Um, they may be in investors, but they're also very, very astute in business and entrepreneurship. And the culture seems to be uh, promoting of that. For example, an ultra net worth family, they'll put the, the children through university, but then they'll work in the business and develop business skills. Whereas I, I come across to Europe and look at the American model of this ultra net worth seg segment, and it's really more of an investment, a preservation type of strategy. Now, because the city, for example, has uh, on one statistic over 6,000 ultra net worths with 30 million or more and leading into the billionaires, it's, and it's a trusted wealth preservation destination, how do you think we can utilize that uh, more effectively to, um, to cultivate wealth creation amongst the innovators and, the, and, and, and this generation of entrepreneurs? Because we're good for private equity, but look at the difference for, between VC uh, in Silicon Valley and, and London. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> okay, Catherine. I actually, I, I wonder where that culture came about from and where was the money created? I mean, I would love, I do see a huge culture in, you know, on the West Coast of entrepreneurs who are high net worth individuals reinvesting their money back into entrepreneurship. So maybe the kind of key is let's create some more entrepreneurs, really successful entrepreneurs in the UK, um, and that culture of they love business. You know, they didn't just do it because it kind of landed on their doorstep. They will invest in other businesses um, because it's part of their culture. I yeah, I agree. I agree with that in part. I, I do think that, and uh, I, I do think that too much money in the city has been made through. Um, what I loosely call this kind of rentier world. I mean, I do think, you know, the asset, man <coughs> the asset management business with its very high charges and <coughs> so much of um, investment banking and certainly proprietary trading is about being, knowing, you, you know, because you make a market and you're also um, <coughs> an agent, you know, you can, uh, you're both, you're conflicted, um, you're both sides of the bargain in a sense. I mean, so much of what goes on in the city um, is, isn't, in my view, about genuine wealth generation. And I think there's, I would exempt um, the best, some of Lloyd's and some of what goes on in the insurance uh, industry, where there's some genuine uh, risk taking. But a lot of it is, a, a, a lot of it is about making money from money and charging the fees in a very opaque way. And so when you actually end up being rather rich, having 50 million or 100 million or whatever it might be or more, I mean, actually, <coughs> You don't actually know this world that actually um, Catherine lives in. I mean, you just don't. You just don't know it. What you know about is actually how to kind of, um, you know, play the play this play that game. And I I think, and I've I've thought this um, kind of all my working life. I began my career in the city. Uh, I mean, I know it's a, I know it's better to have it than not to have it. But actually, I think as a national community, we, we pay a very high price for it. Um, and I. Yeah. Uh, Things may be just changing in the proximity of tech city to the city. Mm. Um, I mean, I was in Boston recently. And there was a kind of fantastic thing happening. There was a kind of—I um, thought it was fantastic. You know, I really liked it. It was a, a couple of squares in Boston where they could all the um, postdocs um, from MIT were showing their invention, their, their latest um, inventions. You know, and there were lots of stalls, and it was like going around a kind of, you know, um, a boot sale in, in, London, in, a, in a field in, uh, in kind of in, in Wiltshire, it, it wasn't that at all. What, each stall had this kind of extraordinary kind of in, innovative thing happening in it. Um, and there were angel investors stalking um, and examining, hoping to get ahead of Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And it was just a kind of, the whole thing was just, um, you know, and I just thought to myself, if, if in Oxford's Broad Street, you know, there could be such a fair, what a breakthrough that would be. Um, you do a bit of that in Imperial, don't you? Yeah, yeah you do. But, you, you, but it's so small. Um, but it's <coughs> growing. Um, so maybe you know. Uh, and I think some of the people in the, some of the, I think there is a, uh, you know, they are high wealth individuals, and they could actually take these risks. Um, 
and they could be persuaded that actually, you know, they could even lose 10% of 100 million or 200 million, and it wouldn't actually matter. Um, but um, if, if, a dozen, if, if enough of them did it, the kind of paybacks um, in terms of actually getting a presence in a, in a sector or, um, might be huge. Mariana, last word. Yeah, I mean, I think, so first of all, I think one of the problems here in the UK is they don't even differentiate private equity and VC for, say, the capital gains treatment yeah. and the taxes. And it was actually the Labour Party that in 2002 reduced the time that private equity has to be invested from 10 years to two years, so actually made, now VC, because it's the same thing, even more <coughs> short-termist than it was. But this whole Silicon Valley thing, and I, I guess I should have just almost just focused on that point because I kind of feel like it's getting repeated here, the whole myth. You know, Tesla Motors, Elon Musk, he's now the big new uh, Silicon Valley hero, 500 million uh, guaranteed loan from Obama, right? So it's just not true that these guys are somehow on, you know, there and they're welcoming all this failure. They're almost all state back, including you know, the big companies like Compaq, Intel, Apple. They all got massive state money in the beginning. And unless you talk about that, then you get into a major dysfunctional thing, which Silicon Valley has today, which is the public school system. It has gone completely down the drain. Now, how you know, wrong is that? Uh, you know, an area of the US that got massive state funding, the money has not come back to the taxpayers that funded it. And we need to talk about that. Otherwise, just you know, mythologizing all these entrepreneurs as if they sort of come out of nowhere. True. I mean, I you know, when I and I'm, I've only spent days there, not weeks. But I mean, the when I when I'm there, I mean, you find you know an acknowledgement of that. I mean, you know, that's why the semiconductor industry is there. You know, it was the uh, Berkeley nuclear semiconductors, Stanford. You know, and you're right. I mean, they do say that. I mean, they do, they do acknowledge that in fairness to them. I mean, that's what, I mean, I, I spent time with, the, with some of the... Uh, who acknowledges that? They, they acknowledge it. I mean, cool. the entrepreneurs, the venture capitalists. I mean, they you know, have the a secessionist movement. They, they, they want to go they, into the coast because well, they, they want to pay taxes. It depends taxes. who you talk to, but I don't think there's a... There's not, I mean, I do think that... It, I mean, I think we should talk about it, but I don't think... I think to accuse them of not talking about it is... Um, misrepresents them. I mean, some of them may not, of course. But I mean, it's, I mean, it is part of the discourse, a, re a recognition that actually, without, I mean, there's a re also recognition that actually of the, of the role played by the two universities too, actually, in fairness. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I mean, they don't, <coughs> they don't think they've all done it by themselves. Can I just make one point, which is hopefully an optimistic point. The United States basically has had no interruption in its mm -hmm. capitalist system for well over a century. Um, and in this country, the, the ravages of punitive taxation, 98p in the pound in the 1940s, nationalization of the commanding heights of the economy, um, rapid periods of inflation, have actually created a serious period in my lifetime in which the accumulation of private wealth was not possible and in which there was every incentive, if you had a business, to sell it for shares to the quoted companies of the City of London, as opposed to your friends who had cash, if they did, in the cities in which the businesses were occupied. It is, in my view, hopeful and incalculable the extent to which Nigel Lawson's budget of 1986 began to change that process when tax rates came down at a top rate of 40% it was possible for the capitalist system to begin to regenerate itself. Since then, there has been a massive increase in the number of small businesses. Now, I don't disagree with practically all the things that are being said about the city and the financial institutions and all that sort of stuff, but underneath there is a growth in the entrepreneurial opportunity of a very much larger number of companies. And if we can continue that to give the certainty and the time it is very possible that we will see a different approach in this country. But we the finish, top rate we under finish Eisenhower on an optimistic was 90%. note. <laughs> 90% under Eisenhower. Top rate. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the panel. And thank you to you. Thank you.